I grew up in La Quamengo, um, which is a little outside of Castries. I absolutely love La Quamengo because of the fantastic views of Marigo and Ancillary and Castries to a certain extent. I grew up at Hospital Road. Uh, Castries was my backyard, riding roller skates, biking with the boys. I am the ninth child of 11 siblings. Uh, I went to the Anglican Primary School and I moved to the Angibles Secondary School. Uh, at that time, they, it was a junior sec. Moved on to the Castries Comprehensive School in Form 4. Spent three years there and then moved on to the A-Level College. Moi c'est Jean Miku. I am from the village of Miku. I attended the Miku Infant School and the Miku Primary School and these were fantastic days. I have very fond memories of attending those two schools. From there, I transitioned to the St. Joseph's Convent. I actually grew up between Bridge Street, Castries, and Maynard Hill. And I went to school at the Castries Anglican Primary School. I mean, my childhood was pretty boring, to say the least. I was raised with a very strict father, so didn't do much, didn't go out much, just um, between school and home really. Following that, I went into the St. Joseph's Convent and then Sir Arthur Lewis. Mainly between Miku Street and Castries and in Grosile, where I spent the next many, many years. Um, I went to school from about age three at the convent but I left in Form 1 and went to school in Barbados boarding school and spent five years there. I think because I was so quiet, because I did not know anybody, I was perceived as a bit rude. So in convent, there was this conduct. You go up there, there are merit badges and conduct badges. So that first semester, I was probably the only person who got a merit badge who did not go up for good conduct. I was like, me, little old me, I hardly talk to anybody. Um, but after that, I mean, that did change. You start interacting and making friends. Um, so again, I think having something to prove, I needed to prove that the little girl from La Quamengo can do it. And I did. Sciences again, my interest. Not very good at sports, admittedly. And the late Jani Williams, she was one of those in Form 3. I remember trying my hand at volleyball. Jani looked at me one day and said, my girl, continue to get your merit badges. The volleyball thing not working out for you. I traveled every day of the five years. Oh, it was fun. Imagine a busload of children coming up from Miku to Castries every morning from about 6 a.m. and getting back home after 4. The amount of mischief we could get up to on the bus and in between the school, the city and Miku, yes, good times. Being in boarding school is very supportive and um, because it's supportive and it's very disciplinarian. So you learn both. You learn to be disciplined in whatever work you do, and you learn that you must support other people. Um, and that's principally what I think stands out the most from school. I went into the St. Joseph's Convent, and then Sir Arthur Lewis. For A-level, I remember being forced into a program that I absolutely did not want to do. When I was growing up, I always wanted to be a chef because I loved cooking. I, I aced food and nutrition. And so I really wanted to be a chef. So I wanted to go to South to study hospitality um, studies. And there were, well, I got a three maths. So because of that, obviously, I did not get priority to go into that program. Persons who got ones and twos um, got pri priority into the program. But my father insisted that I'm not going to stay in the house and wait a full year to get into that program, so I'm going to do whatever is available. And what was available? Secretarial studies. The one thing that I had vowed never in my life to be was a secretary, and there I was doing secretarial studies. What stood out particularly for me was I was the captain, when I took over the captaincy of Heron House, uh, that year we won for the first time in a long time and we carried that championship for two years. So that stood out for me. Uh, at that point, even before that, I was a house captain at Entrepreneur Junior Sec as well. 
but uh, winning the championship after so long Heron House, Blue House hadn't won, uh, it was an accomplishment for me. And uh, from that day onwards, I thought, I'm a leader. After the A-level college, I worked at Pricewaterhouse during the summers. And when I was done with the A-level college, I, back then it was Pete Mawik. Uh, I moved to Pete Mawik. They hired me full time as a secretary. I think Pricewaterhouse sort of gave me the, the stepping, it was like a stepping stone in my professional career. I loved accounting. Uh, I do not like audit, so I stayed in accounting. I was the assistant accountant there, and a job opportunity came up at Sunshine Bookshop after being an accountant there, assistant accountant for seven years. One single memory in Cuba that stands out to me, I don't know that it could, I think there was a dengue campaign once, and we as students, because in Cuba you have to be involved in everything. It's not just a question of being in the classroom, you have to be involved from day one. Um, in terms of seeing patients and interacting with patients, going out into the community because that is how medicine is in Cuba. And we were doing, um, I think, what we call it pesquisaje. So they go out to find things. Things don't come to you when you're surprised that this is happening. We're going out um, to do dengue, work with dengue, in the, essentially, to find the patients, um, to guide them, to teach and to educate. And there was this little girl and she's like, <laughs> Pero de donde tu eres? And what I mean is, where are you from? Ay, mira que bella son, y mira como hablan. That she just thought us speaking the way we spoke, because obviously the accent when you speak in Spanish is, was very intriguing to her. And this little girl followed us the whole time through her community. And as it turned out, she later did go into medical school. She's currently in medical school right now because we were able to keep in touch with her. So there are things um, that you know, if you've inspired one person to do one thing in life, I think it's something to be proud of, and I do think we had something to do with this particular little Cuban girl um, going into medicine and, of course, joining the um, La Batalla de la Armada de Batas Blancas, as they call in Cuba, so the White Coat Army. And she's going to be part of that, and we suspect she's going to be brilliant at it. When I came back home, because I completed medical school in 2007, um, came home, worked in the departments of internal medicine and oncology recognizing the sheer number of patients in St. Lucia who had chronic kidney disease um, and at the time we did not have our own nephrologists. What we had would be Cuban nephrologists who would come for two year periods and go back home, do two year stints. And the sense of ownership I believe is simply not there when you come to a place um, which is not your home for two years and then you go back. So I felt not only did I like that particular system in medical school because there was a need in St. Lucia that's what I was going to do. So I did get a scholarship in 2010 and went back to do nephrology. Um, I completed those studies in 2013 and I've been back here since then. I left Sir Arthur and I went into a secretarial role, of course, because that's what I studied and that's where I did my job training. And that's how I started my career as a secretary at, at SLBGA at the time. Um, after that, I worked within the government service. I started as a temp, so I would hold on for persons who went off on vacation, you know, prolonged vacation or maternity leave. And I moved from one ministry to the next because, I mean, I, I made a, I, I guess I, I proved myself as somebody who was very focused. You know, very few young persons were um, as focused or demonstrated some of the personal attributes that I demonstrated and so I was sought after. So as soon as I left one department, they would assign me to another. I did that for maybe about two years. So I moved from um, the Ministry of Finance, Prime Minister's Office, Registry of Civil Status, Ministry of Tourism, um, and some other areas. And, and then I moved into the Ministry of Communications and Works at the time. Calix George was the the minister. I became his secretary and I was appointed finally within the service as a secretary. I worked with him for a short while and then they started the project to corporatize WASA into WASCO and they needed an admin person so he volunteered. It was his project, his baby, he volunteered his secretary. So I moved over to WASA worked on the project while I was there. 
I got the opportunity to apply to Cable and Wireless because there was a vacancy. And so once I was done with the project, I actually was successful at the Cable and Wireless interview. I never went back to the ministry, I left the service and went into the private sector and I've been there ever since. From the St. Joseph's Convent, I, I taught for two years. I think that's where I started my whole career path, but moved into meteorology. At that time, I thought this was what I really wanted to do. I wanted to fly into the eyes of hurricanes and stuff like that. So I worked at the Met Office for 11 years and decided that I was a bit more ambitious than this because there were so many other guys who were more senior to me and the possibility of upward mobility was very slim. I stopped when I moved off to study my master's in 2005. I started off as a student in the challenge program at the uni university, well it was con continuing studies at the time, on the morning and so it was part-time study. I would travel on evenings to class and then sometimes from class head back straight to work because I'd be working the night shift at the airport at the time. So I did my first two years of my program locally, part-time. What stood out for me in my final year of study in Trinidad? Hmm. It was a whole different cultural experience. I met some fantastic people, but I think at that point, I really fell in love with international business management. And it was at that point, after having gone through that course, I decided that this is what I really want to specialize in and do my master's in. 1989, Miss Independence, our 10th independence anniversary. The year prior to that, I had won the Miss Southern Extravaganza. 1988 in Viewfort. And so given that I represented Miku, I think it was determined that it would have been the natural progression for me to represent my constituency, my community at the Independence Parade. And so I did that. At the time I was just thinking of, you know, the prize money that I could use towards my tuition. And I figured, why not go out and give it a shot? I remember that night very vividly. I remember when we dipped backstage and I got number one. And I figured, okay, I could just remain in that place throughout the night. And it so happened that that's what happened. University of the West Indies was a tougher situation than the university in Canada. But it was very exhilarating and it was wonderful to meet so many people from different islands, all with very similar goals. So the law faculty was, was really exciting for that reason. Law was interesting, it was appealing, I mean it it really served to tickle your mind. It also taught you that um, how important justice is and fairness to fellow man um, and it really expanded, it opened your mind to um, rights, people's rights, which I think very important. I got married when I was in law school and um, so that meant that I really followed my then husband's career from very early. So we started out in Barbados and there I was in private practice for a few years and then we moved to Antigua and there I was um, the Registrar of the High Court, Acting Registrar of the High Court and Deputy Registrar of the Court of Appeal of Antigua for Antigua. And um, then we moved to the United States and there I worked with uh, an organization, an NGO that dealt with battered, desperate migrant women. Um, and what we used to do was try to get the T visa, which is a US visa that allows these women to remain in the United States even if they are being abused by their spouses or um, anyone of that nature. Moving along, I then went to live in Africa and there I was not really able to practice unless I went back to school and that I did not want to do. So for a short while I worked, I assisted um, a friend of mine who was a lawyer over there, uh, mainly in office management but it gave me the opportunity to go into art, which I had started to love. And so um, I spent a lot of time painting and a lot of time traveling 
Africa, especially Ghana, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Benin, really looking at the people and looking for great um, shots. Since I love um, portraiture, it was more about the people than even the topography. After seven years of working at Price for the House, uh, the opportunity came up uh, to run Sunshine Bookshop. Uh, it was given, it was asked of my, at the time, the accountant, and she decided it wasn't the time for her to move. So I said, what about me? I'm ready. So I left Price for the House to move into management, and that was in 1996. So I stayed there for almost three years, and I got a little bored. <laughs> it was time to move on. When I left uh, Sunshine Bookshop, I came to Caribbean Metals for three years. A job opportunity came up, sales and marketing manager. Stayed for three years, decided I need to change course. I need to get qualified. So I left Sanusha, packed my bags, decided not to take a loan, go to Trinidad. And the reason I did not take a loan, took all my savings, is because I wasn't sure if I wanted to come back to Sanusha. The idea I had was, after my last exam, I would sit on my suitcase outside Pent Road in Chaguanas, Trinidad, and do left, right, eeny, meeny, and where the wind took me, that is where I was going to go. But again, I came back to St. Lucia, and I remember particularly it was one Christmas uh, dinner. Uh, I was invited, Caribbean Metals invited me, and my director at the time, John Francis, came up to me and said, you know, that job, you left behind two years ago, it's available. I said, okay, I'm aware, because the guy who I trained to take over from me, uh, he left about three months before I completed my studies, because I completed my studies in, in two years, which is the shortest possible time I had a plan. And he said, look, I'm leaving your job for you, come manage your staff. I'm like, we'll see about it. So when I got back, uh, at a Christmas dinner, my job, my boss offered me the job, and I said, why not? And here I am since nine, 2003. So I've been with Caribbean Metals this year, I believe it's 23 years. To whom much is given, um, much is expected, and we have to give back in that way. So I made it a point at every turn um, to do what I can to educate not only about kidney disease, but about general disease. We hear so much about the non-communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension. So to educate the population um, about that. As president of the St. Lucia Medical and Dental Association since 2019, not particularly easy, especially now um, during COVID-19. The reality is as a leader, you are dealing with multiple different personalities um, and you have to try to find a way to bring it all together and lead the organization in a way that you're doing the best that you possibly can do for the general membership. There are many roadblocks, there are many stumbling blocks, and COVID-19 really um, has brought out the best in some of us and the worst in some of us. Those are the realities. Any crisis is going to do that, um, but finding a way to inspire people, to get people to um, get involved and do what we all have to do to get the country through this, it has not been easy. We think thus far we've done pretty well, uh, myself and the mostly female executive, um, in moving the SLMDA forward and getting it to a place that we could contribute meaningfully um, to this fight, general, generally for healthcare in St. Lucia, for better healthcare, for equitable healthcare, but even more so during this COVID-19 pandemic. With COVID-19, what we've noticed is that there are many women in leadership in St. Lucia. When you look at the physician body um, in our hospitals and our health centers, it's predominantly women. When you look at the medical director, the chief medical officer, so all those key positions um, are held by women. So we do have a very strong voice and a very strong say um, in the decision making, in the policy making um, in this country as it pertains to healthcare and certainly as it pertains to COVID-19. When I got into my first HR role, I had no experience in HR. I had never studied HR. I worked with a Pakistani at the time. I was the only St. Lucian in what was called the East Area Office at Cable and Wireless. So it was a sort of a regional office based there. Again, based on my personality, don't say no to a challenge. I saw it as an opportunity and said, you know what? 
if he sees, sees something in me to make him have that level of confidence and take that chance on somebody who has no background or training or experience in the field, then I need to give it a shot and not make him regret that, that decision. So I took on the job. It was in the call center at the supervisory level. So that was my promotion into supervisor st um, status. And then within a very short time, well, I registered with, the, with UE to actually complete a program in human resource management because I felt I'm not going into this thing blindly. I need to, you know, equip myself with the knowledge and the skills to really be good at this because I don't like to fail, you know. So I moved on from the call center into the St. Lucia business unit as a manager this time. Um, and shortly after that, I was promoted to the vice president of HR. And shortly after that, head of HR for the Southern Caribbean cluster. I say shortly after that, but these, role, these promotions were like two or three years apart. But I was always very involved in everything that happened in the organization. I think my success in HR is attributed to the fact that I made it my business to know the business. I do recall the question. It has been a question that has played in my mind very often for the years. I remember being asked, do I believe that Caribbean women are exploited? And my answer to this was, no, I didn't think we were. Because I noted at the time that Caribbean women had been finding themselves in a number of positions which in some other parts of, of the world would have been considered positions primarily um, or traditionally held by men. But in the Caribbean, our women, I think, had been pretty much more forward in that they had found themselves in the courtroom, in the boardroom, in the classroom, holding prominent positions in our communities. And so back then in 1989, I did not think our Caribbean women were being exploited. A number of experiences through the years have honed my, honed my skills, my abilities, and I think well prepared me to be the permanent secretary of a ministry as big as the Department of Education, Innovation and Gender Relations. I can recall when I was told, when I decided I needed to transition from meteorology into something more a mainstream public service, and I was told I was being promoted to the post of accountant, I cried. Because accounting for me was a language all onto itself. It's not something that I understood. It's not a career path that I ever sought for myself. However, the individual that I am would not allow me to fail as an accountant. And so I gave it every effort. I was the senior accountant at the Ministry of Infrastructure, then Communications and Works. I moved on as the financial analyst at Ministry of Finance and Legal Affairs. And in all of my skill sets, that probably would have been one I would have considered as one of my weaker areas. But that experience in the public service in those various career positions definitely stands me in good stead to function at, at the helm of this ministry. Because especially now in these critical economic times with limited resources and finances, I think my knowledge of government accounting and finance allows me to function effectively in this position. Dealing with a challenge, I recognize it for what it is and look to see how I could best find a solution. And I know sometimes the solution does not always reside within me. I look to the people around me as well to come up with possible solutions to whatever the challenge is. Wow, I was passing once in the car, it was like three, four hours out of Accra, and I saw these children sitting on stools outside in the open air and a man looking like he was instructing them. That's all they had, stools. They did not even have slates or anything. And he was under a tree and I asked, well, what is he doing? They said, that's their school and that's their teacher. So I got out of the car and I spoke to him after a while and he said, that's what they have. So I went back and um, in speaking to the Diplomatic Association at one of our meetings, 
I asked if we could, you know, get donations for that particular tribe, which we did. And um, so I would collect on their behalf school books, supplies, funds, anything that I could get to help them. And then I would drive out the three to four hours and meet them. And they were always happy to see me. There is a, a system in, in many parts of the world, but where I was in Ghana, where um, debt is repaid by the, let's say, the indentureship or the apprenticeship of girls, young girls. So that led me to want to find out more. And I went again out into the communities. I would go to the puberty festivals. These, um, that's where you, brides are chosen, young brides early. And I would go and, and observe them and just speak to the, to the women, find out what they think about, about what they're doing. Now, I don't want us to take our Western viewpoint of this either. So I was careful not to form too many judgments. It was all very eye-opening to me and um, led me to appreciate what democracy, fairness, justice that I had learned in St. Lucia really looks like. So COVID-19 is very hard on all of us, both sexes. Um, but I think it, it is particularly hard on women because we are the caregivers. Um, as caregivers, we are doing not just earning a living as men would have, as men, men have the, responsi have the responsibility of being the breadwinner, but they don't have the additional burden of the caregiving. They may if they choose, but generally speaking, they don't. So women found themselves now either in quarantine or isolation or whatever they need to be um, at home because they've been sent home as, as many of us that don't need to gather as possible. So they're at home, but they're still the ones, they also, the kids are also at home because of schools have closed. So they're the ones working from home, teaching from home and doing all the caregiving. They're, they're, invariably, they're looking after a mother or a grandmother as well. And those support systems for those people are also not available. Not even church is available. So you find, the, I think, the burden really rests heavily on women. General manager, that sums it up, <laughs> managing everything. Uh, so I oversee the entire operations of the company. We have a staff complement of about 45 um, persons. Uh, manage, management structure, production manager, sales and marketing manager. Uh, then we have a senior accountant uh, and the rest uh, line staff. Uh, so I just manage the entire operation, ensure that we procure goods on time. Uh, I have someone doing that, but I oversee that. Ensure that the goods that come in are the highest quality and standards. Uh, ensure that we our customer service is par excellence, so ensure that we do continuous training with our staff uh, in terms of uh, technology, continuously putting technology in our processes. Uh, one of the things I made a commitment to myself was every year we're going to bring in a new product line, which is what we've been doing. Uh, we want to get to a one-stop shop. So right now, my feelers are out looking at, you know, the avenues and how can we achieve that. A lot of our processes um, is done by mail, by, uh, by the guys, the gentlemen, uh, in terms of the crane, handling the crane, welding, and stuff like that. Uh, so we have most of our processes. The, it's, it's sort of like mail dominate, dominating now, <laughs> for now. <laughs> The staff members have never gotten the sense that they would not prefer a female boss or they would prefer a male boss. I think because I'm female, uh, I believe it, it is something that they, I believe they're proud of it. And I think more so that I'm a solution. Even our customers, the contractors and so, I think it's a welcoming thing. Uh, I find they're, they're very, you, you don't get a, a sense of, you know, why would I want to deal with a woman? 
I did have an, ex, uh, uh, an experience though, but it was with a company from overseas. I believe they were Israelites from Israel. And I don't believe <laughs> they have that sort of women in those roles. And even when they wanted to conduct business, they literally said they preferred to deal with a man. From my experience, I don't feel disenfranchised. I'm doing this job and what people perceive me to be on the outside. As a matter of fact, if you look around in this type of job I'm doing, which is hardware, construction, if you look around, a lot of our leaders, business leaders, are women. Take, for example, when you look in the South, particularly in the South, a lot of those businesses in the one that I'm running are headed by women. Uh, so that's a plus. Um, like I said earlier, I think people generally welcome seeing women at the helm of those industries. It does, I believe it does something to our nation, the way we perceive women, which is a good thing. We know the stigma attached to women are always uh, the underdogs and there is no parity. Um, I believe there is still a, a sense of no parity uh, in terms of remuneration. Women, men, men just have to show up. Women have to show up and come with all the credentials. We know that. But in terms of persons giving of that sort of sentiment, I don't feel, I, I've never experienced it, and I don't feel, like I said, anything but support for women in my role. I will not say that misogyny is, of course, the exceptions to every rule, but misogyny is a major issue um, here in St. Lucia if only because I think we are in the majority. So if hypothetically there were a misogynistic person, you simply don't get that opportunity to have it manifested so much because there are so many more female physicians and in leading roles than there are men. So we work very well um, with our male counterparts because we recognize that you have to work together because if this isn't done collaboratively, just healthcare generally. There's this fight against um, COVID-19, this global pandemic, and just about everything that we could possibly talk about as it relates to problems or opportunities there are, that we as women, sometimes viewed as emotional, the emotion sometimes does come up, but I think the heart is there. I think St. Lucia is gender balanced, though some may say that our men are becoming more marginalized, but I do recognize that we have attained gender parity within the public service, gender parity in terms of salaries for men and women. I can say for the most part, I am treated as an equal and a professional. Among my colleague permanent secretaries, my opinions are sought and valued. Even when I represent my ministry or my country internationally, I feel treated as, a, as an equal, respected as a professional. There are instances, of course, where misogyny has read its ugly head and you find persons are not always willing to take directives from a, a female head. But these are in the minority. These instances are in the minority. At the beginning of my career, you know, when people found out what job I had, they were like looking around the room for who really holds the position, you know? Um, and people would be like, that's... At the time, I was Goretti Lorenzi, and said, that's Goretti Lorenzi? That's the VP of HR? Because I look like this little girl, you know? And some people would not appreciate what I brought to the table from just looking at me. But when I, when I start to speak, I win them over eventually, you know? But um, at the beginning, it was a challenge because of that. I remember not putting a photo on my LinkedIn profile for a long time just to avoid the discrimination, the age discrimination, because I got it all the time. So HRWISE is a full service human resource management company, which I started after I left Cable & Wireless. So having journeyed through Cable & Wireless and reaching the a senior leadership position within the region, I felt like, you know, I had done my part there. I felt like I had already, because I'm a fixer by nature, so I go in and I fix things, I put policies, I implement things, I train people, I focus a lot on training, so I train the managers 
to be able to function at a higher level. There became a time where I felt like, okay, my job here is done, there's nothing more I can do. Um, and so it was time for me to move on into something a little more challenging. In St. Lucia, I know that we have a large number of women in senior positions, more than many other countries. I know that there are situations where the inequality is very clear, the biases are very clear, but luckily for me, I've never experienced it. I worked in an environment where the question of gender never came up. And I was able to progress throughout my career, never feeling any worse off or, any, or that I was treated differently because I was a woman. I, I never felt that. At present, I work as the Senate President of the Parliament of St. Lucia. I am also an attorney at law and I have a, and I'm in private practice. And I also work as a chair of, I'm the chairperson of the um, Independence Committee. I'm also the chair of the National Archives and the Cultural Development Foundation. My favorite is the, being the Senate President. It allows me to use what I'm trained to do, which, and, I, and it allows me to go right back to what I learned and how I felt growing up about fairness, um, transparency, good governance, justice, etc. In the conduct of my work as Senate President, I try to remain um, as unemotional as possible. I think that's the only way you can do it. Because you're listening to two sides of a story and, um, and you're trying to be fair, you're trying to be the referee if needs be. Um, and so I believe that getting involved in the debate itself and feeling th the passion and the emotion on both sides does not serve you well. So I try to be as um, unemotional as possible. Sometimes they say I don't smile and I'm not enjoying the jokes, etc. I, I try to stay out of that. I don't really think that anything should become an issue because you're female. I just come with the view that I've come to do a job or a project and I do it regardless of gender. But I will see that Generally, older men are very supportive, younger men are a little bit admiring, females, most women are supportive, almost all age groups are supportive. The biggest challenge comes with the, the, male that, the males that are in my age group. So I think there's a little bit of a challenge there, maybe they have a little discomfort with um, women in authority. But having lived in other parts where I saw, you know, burning of brides and, 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 and children being um, sold off to older men and things like that, where I saw women not allowed to go out to work, um, where I saw widows not allowed to work because their husbands were now, now dead, where I saw so much disadvantage to women, being at home, I'll say that we live in a matriarchal, to my mind, a matriarchal society where women really have a lot of authority and run their homes. Um, even if you look, they're well educated. In some areas, there are actually many more women educated than men in law. If you look at the civil service, if you look at even our, our governance, we have had women at the top for many years. Where we are disadvantaged is in economic empowerment. So women really have to, they run their homes, but they're, most of the men, I don't want to say most, let me not exaggerate, a lot of men are roving. So she might be in charge of her household, but she's reliant partly on a roving gentleman. And that creates a little instability 
um, in the home and stress for the woman. In our field in medicine, there are patients who believe if you're female, you're a nurse, 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 and everybody, there's nothing wrong with being a nurse, and we absolutely love our nurses. But if you're a young female, automatically um, you're a nurse to many patients, and I would prefer to see the male doctor. It happens. Thankfully, it's not as prevalent as it used to be, but it still happens. But I do think we've made huge strides um, towards attaining um, that goal of gender equality. We're not yet where we want to be, but it is significantly better than where we were a few years ago. There is nothing stopping a woman from doing the same jobs that men do. You know, somebody asked me a question the other day. Um, it was about, it was recruitment. They were hiring for a position and the position required the individual to go into a freezer. You know, it's like wholesale, like the supermarkets. Um, and when they were going through the applications, there was a lady who applied and they said they don't think it's suitable for her. And they were talking about the fact that she has to go into the freezer and what it will do to her body. And, and I'm thinking to myself, why is that even a consideration? It's not her responsibility to figure that out and assess that risk. And if she feels having a, because she's fully aware, she works in the organization. So she fully, she's fully aware of the job and what it requires. And yet she has said, I would like to fill this role. Why are we having the gender conversation about whether or not she should be shortlisted? Does she meet the criteria? Yes, she does. So let's interview her. Um, and she got the job. I can't say that there are any challenges that I face that are rooted in the fact that I am woman. Of course, in any organization, I think mainly persons are resistant to change. And so when they're faced with the decision of an alternative vision or a different pathway, I note that persons can be subtly resistant, subtly defiant, sometimes openly resistant, other times missing in action. But I don't think all of it stems from the fact that they're being led by a woman. Two of the main areas where we do not have, say, a 30% quota of women in top leadership positions. I would consider to be one the armed forces, say the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, where our women have really not broken the, the glass ceiling in that aspect. Though they are quite competent, we have had a number of women within the police force who have excelled in their areas, in their fields, but we have not had a female police commissioner. I would love to see a lot more women get into politics because I know we can do the job. Uh, and I don't think it's a fault of anybody um, on the outside is preventing women from coming. I think uh, politics has gotten to a place where persons, and I know good friends of mine, who would be willing to get into the politics. But because of how it's become in terms of uh, the rhetoric and the digging up your past and all of that. I think persons, both men and women, uh, they tend not to want to get into it. I think more so for women, because women are more a conservative type. Men don't um, internalize those things. You say stuff about men and they forget. But women, I believe, would more internalize these things because of uh, our nature. I would love to see women who are more vocal, women who are more um, confident and can own their position and, you know, set an example for the younger ones coming up to be in leadership positions within our government. I think that would make a huge impact. Around the world, we are seeing so many women now being prime ministers and presidents of various countries, and that's definitely something to be proud of because it means that we're finally making some headway in that regard. But locally in St. Lucia, yes, we do have some women um, in government, but I, I still don't feel like women are represented at that level. In the legislature, I think we need to improve um, the numbers of women, especially if 
women want to address their own issues. They see it from a different light. Um, they deem what the priorities are, and this needs to be done by women. St. Lucia right now is at about 29-30% women in legislature. The world standard is 30%. Um, but there are other Caribbean territories that are at 45%. So I think we have a way to go still. If I tell someone I'm an introvert, nobody would believe that. But I think that's my default state. However, I know that I need to put myself out there sometimes, you know, and become a bit of an extrovert. So I, I psych up myself for those occasions when I have to be very social. Apart from that, I'm an avid reader. And I recently, in October, November, there about discovered fluid art, which is something that I have just taken a liking to. Fluid art is using acrylic paints, resin, different, well, that kind of stuff to create artwork, coasters, anything that you could possibly think of. And I've spent a lot of the last couple months, this is how I, I relax from my stressful job, creating coasters and doing some fluid art pieces. I have a very strong support system and that has been always. It starts from my home. My mom is my biggest cheerleader. She's also my, my mentor. She's the person that I look up to. Has always been, she's pretty much my best friend. I come back up the world blasting my music in my car and feeling good. I also have two lovely children. I have a 22-year-old son and a 17-year-old daughter, and they keep me grounded. They like to say that they're the ones keeping me young. So anything that requires me to be out in nature, I love peace and tranquility. So on a weekend, I would just find somewhere to go that, that gives me that, whether it's the beach, find a waterfall, find some place that I've not seen before. Dogs. I love pets. I have six dogs. I love cats. I love dogs. I love to read and just watch good. I love true crime. I mean, some people think of it as very morbid and very sinister, but I absolutely love true crime again to see how the human mind works. How is a person capable of doing this? Um, so those are the things I do in my downtime. There isn't a lot of it, um, but I do value it. I really enjoy, most of all, music and art. Um, and I can stay for, I think, months, maybe even longer, maybe even years, just painting and listening to music. Um, I don't need to interact a lot um, once I'm able to do those two things. I love, love art. I love anything to do with it. The history of art, the exhibitions of art, the painting, just the process of thinking how to create a painting, um, and any of the spin-offs of that. The other thing that I would take time to do is to go and dance country and western. <laughs> I had Two of my friends, girls, women, who were already in the sport. And I had a customer of mine who was in the sport as well. And he said, you know what? You need to come there, you know, because that's where you'll meet a lot of your customers and your big customers. And I'm like, okay, if I'm going to meet customers, <laughs> if I'm going to meet customers and it brings in more business, why not? So, uh, but fortunately for me, getting in there, the, cus the customers or the persons I met there were already customers, were already friends of mine. 
and particularly, like I said, my girlfriends, uh, two of them who were in it, and they're like, you know what, let's do it. I think we need, golf needs a, a, a new face. It needs some, you know, some new looks. <laughs> I would advise any 17 year old to don't think that where you're at at that point in your life is where you're necessarily going to end up. Because if at 17 somebody had told me, Michelle, you're going to be the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education, I would have probably laughed. I would have found that very far-fetched. However, I want to advise as well that we should embrace challenges along the way. And even sometimes we have our mindset on a certain course of action or career path, it does not hurt if we are provided with an opportunity to move in a different direction to embrace that. Always, always make a list of what you intend to do, of your plans. It is wise, even if some of them seem unachievable, unattainable. Just make a list. I would tell any 17-year-old girl that there is nothing that you cannot achieve in life. There is no, the sky is the limit, there is no ceiling. You are protected by your constitution, which gives you rights, which, which makes sure that you are not placed at a disadvantage because of your sex. Therefore, whatever you can dream, you can accomplish. Do what you love. Not everybody has to be a doctor. Not everybody has to be a lawyer. You can change the world in no matter what you do. But whatever you do, do it with passion.